All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Porter, and I am a guide here at Yemniska Mountain Adventures. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you a countdown of my top five favorite hikes that I like to guide for Yemniska. So here we go. And I'll just say at the beginning here that if you have any questions or uh, put your comments down um, in the comment box below uh, what your favorite hikes are, I'll try and take some questions at the end. So I'm an ACMG ski guide and uh, avalanche professional. And in the summers, I work as a hiking guide and I've been with Yemniska since 2013. And since then, I've had the pleasure of guiding um, pretty much all of their hikes. Um, so here we go. Can I get to the next slide? All right, so number five on the list. Um, this one made it on the list because a lot of folks come out to Canmore and Banff and they want to see the iconic Lake Louise. And so number five is Mount St. Perrin, which is in Banff National Park. It's in the Lake Louise group. It's uh, what I would call a moderate day hike and it's 13 kilometers long and you gain about 920 meters elevation, which sounds like a lot, but the trail itself is actually quite, um, quite gentle for most of the way. So this one, you're off at Lake Louise, the iconic turquoise, beautiful lake, and you climb up um, gently through the forest in what feels like a uh, human migration. <laughs> and if you've ever hiked uh, to Lake Agnes itself, um, which is the first stop along the way up Mount St. Perrin, you'll uh, know what I mean. And if you haven't, you'll find out. So at Lake Agnes, um, it's pretty cool to take a little break and grab some tea. They've got uh, over 100 loose leaf teas. And this little tea house was built in 1901 by CPR. And it was named after the first First Lady of Canada um, so if you start this hike early in the morning, grab a cup of tea and a biscuit, uh, keep going and you leave most of the crowds behind. So as you climb up, um, basically it's um, switchbacking elevator um, all the way to the summit. And my favorite time to do this hike and to guide it is in the shoulder season. So you get to experience uh, when the larches turn gold. Uh, as you can see in this photo, this um, it's pretty spectacular. The needles line the trail and it's pretty special. Um, and while most tours are down at the lake and staring up at the glaciers themselves, you're sort of eye level with the glaciers and sometimes you can catch these calving events. And then from the, from the summit itself, um, you're pretty up close and personal with all the big peaks of the Louise group. Um, so you can see Mount Temple, uh, Aberdeen, Lefroy, Ahado, um, all the big peaks. And it's just 360 endless views of mountains, larches, and really bright green and turquoise lakes. So this one made it to the list uh, because it's an awesome peak uh, to initiate a healthy addiction uh, to summiting. So the next one on the list, it, number four, is the Cory Edith Pass Loop. And this is in Banff National Park. It's another day hike and you ascend over a thousand meters and it's about 13 kilometers It's in the Vermilion Range. And this one made it on the list because if you only have a limited amount of time in the Canadian Rockies, um, it's a must do. It's a, probably the most spectacular day hike uh, close to our office here in Banff and Canmore. Um, so most hikes in the Canadian Rockies, you are deep in the evergreen forest. But here on this hike, at least for the start, you get to enjoy these uh, open, expansive aspen groves. And 
if you hit it at the right time, the wildflowers just sort of blanket um, ben beneath the aspens. So it's a loop hike as well. Um, but like, like I said, you do have to travel up a thousand meters and uh, some of it can be sort of challenging walking, which is why I like guiding it. Um, and here you can see you, just, you have to cross some steep gullies and sometimes use your hands, which makes it quite interesting. Uh, after that, um, you're rewarded with a pretty beautiful alpine uh, traverse that you have sweeping views down into the Bow Valley and you can see at the bottom of the photo here, the Bow River and the occasional train going by way down in the valley below you. So this alpine traverse basically pongs you straight up to uh, Quarry Pass, which is a 2,350 meter pass. And even in July and August, you can have snow up here, which is kind of unique. So after having a lunch in the sun, looking down at the Bow Valley, uh, the next thing is passing through the gargoyles. So the gargoyles are guarding the next leg of the hike of the loop. And they are these rocky uh, features that enter. Um, they're the entrance for the Gargoyle Valley. So this is the Gargoyle Valley there. It's steep. It's steep and it's quite a rocky, snowy descent. And it's usually void of all green. So it's basically just you and the mountain goats in this valley and these big craggy limestone walls looming above you. And in the lower part of the Gargoyle Valley, that's when you uh, get up close and personal with uh, one of the most stunning peaks in the Rockies. Um, this is Mount Louis. And in the foreground, you can see uh, the Conrad Cane route. That route was first climbed in 1916. Um, and it was, at the time, a pretty impressive feat, uh, considering the lack of technical climbing gear today. It's a five seven. So that's the Cory Eve path pass loop in Banff National Park, number three. Sorry, number four. All right, number three on my list of top guided hikes um, is the All Souls Alpine Route in Lake O'Hara, and it's also called the Alpinist Traverse. It's about 12 kilometers, 750 meters up and down. And I would rate this hike as a moderate hike. Uh, the reason that this hike made the list is um, not only for the sort of outer worldly uh, views of the peaks around you and the colors um, of the peaks, which are a little bit different from the traditional limestone. Um, it's that the trails were actually crafted by hand by a group of really dedicated people um, in, in and around the 1940s. And over 50 years, these folks actually built the trails by hand. It kind of feels like you're walking on a piece of art. So this trail is um, not your typical trail. Um, which is why it's on the list. Uh, most of this circuit is, uh, it follows rough paths uh, through scree. You're following paint marks on boulders and uh, it's just really different, um, but still accessible, which is why it's rated moderate. So from the All Souls Alpine, Alpine Prospect, you can look down and um, see the super emerald waters of Lake O'Hare itself and all the peaks around it. So you can see in this photo, uh, Huber, Victoria, Lefroy, Yaknes, and those are all uh, peaks that most alpinists aspire to climb. So here's some of the open expansive scree fields that you get to walk and meander along. And you're basically circumnavigating Lake O'Hara itself. So you're sampling basically all it has to offer. And this trip into Lake O'Hara 
it can be done as a multi-day trip. So we do it um, often. We take the Parks Canada bus in and uh, spend a few nights at the campground or um, if you're lucky enough to stay at the Lake O'Hara Lodge, that's pretty special as well. And um, this is just one of the hikes that you can do if you're there for a couple of days. Um, but if you only have one day, you can do this um, by catching the bus or walking the long road in. And so finally, um, after doing your big alpine traverse, uh, you plunge back down to Lake O'Hara and maybe grab a carrot cake at the shelter there uh, before you're heading out or back to your tent. There's a photo of why Lake O'Hara is so special. So that brings us to number two and number two on the list. Uh, it would be number one if number of photos that I have are any kind of measure of how good a trip is. Uh, this one would have taken the number one spot. Um, so this one is uh, on the list because it's truly an incredible trip for the senses. It's a feast for the eyes and uh, also it's a feast for the quads as well. So this one is the rock wall. Uh, it's a backpacking trip in Kootenai National Park. It's about 55 kilometers long. We normally start at the paint pots and uh, we travel northwest uh, along the Vermilion Range over to Flow Lake. Uh, so I rate this backpacking trip as easy to moderate because we actually get uh, the pleasure of having some of our food, food brought in for us. Um, so we don't have to carry it all, which is pretty nice. So that's one of the things that our awesome Yamiska staff does here. So this is a photo of Good Surpass. And if we take five days to do it, we can uh, take a side trip up to Good Surpass. And these are some of the 11,000 foot peaks that are actually really hard to access. And so it's kind of a rare glimpse into a mountain range that doesn't get frequented that often. And then we spend two nights at the bottom of this giant waterfall. This is Helmet Falls. It's, um, yeah, just a really nice place to rest your head for a couple nights and uh, start building up your energy for uh, what's to come. And the rock wall is truly a roller coaster of a hike. You're constantly ascending and descending and down at the bottoms of the valleys. Normally there's really good bridges that Parks Canada puts in for us, uh, but sometimes uh, there's no bridge and you have to get a little creative. And you can see um, it's not quite the pigeon spire and the bugaboos, but uh, we definitely had to use the, um, the Ocheval method here. So like I said, it's a roller coaster of a trip. You're constantly ascending and descending. So you're gaining a lot of elevation and losing it during the day. Um, but when you climb, it's worth it. And you end up in these open alpine meadows and your hiking companion is that giant thousand meter limestone wall that you see in front of these people here. So my favorite time to guide this hike is in September and September in the Rockies can feel like summer or it can feel like winter. Um, so some of the reasons why I like guiding in September in the fall is you can forage on some berries um, so that kind of stuff is, is available to you. And uh, the main reason is the large trees. So here in the Rockies, uh, like I said, it's mostly evergreen forests, but you have these, um, the golden larches that are basically the gatekeepers of the Rockies, or sorry, of the Alpine. And they're so special because they, Basically, they lose all their needles, um, and they're only they're, they're the only evergreen to do that. But before they lose all their needles, they turn this bright yellow gold, and then they drop their needles on the trail. So you're following this golden path into the alpine. And these are really slow-growing trees, so they're actually really ancient trees, and it's just a really special experience.
So at the end of the roller coaster ride, um, for your last uh, pass that you have to go over, it's a high one. And uh, sometimes there's snow at the passes. And this is what makes uh, these multi-day trips uh, so <laughs> exciting, is that you never really know what you're going to get. There's not really a weather forecast that you're looking at every morning. So you kind of get what you get and you have to go through it. And for us, it was uh, some thigh of snow. Uh, but the reason we go through it and we put ourselves through all of that is for views like this. So this is the grand finale of the rock wall trip. This is Flow Lake and Flow Peak and the golden larches around it. So this is on a late September trip, although it looks like winter. Um, yeah, you can see the lower end of Flow Peak actually has those small glaciers. So it's kind of got this necklace of glaciers around it, which is pretty cool. And yeah, you drop down and that's your that's where you're staying for the night. So Flow Lake, it's um, just, there's no way to describe it. You kind of have to experience it um, with how close you are to the glaciers and um, yeah, real sense of remoteness. And you're not alone out there. Um, there's all kinds of wildlife, although we don't see a lot of wildlife because Typically, they're afraid of us. Um, this is a hoary marmot uh, having dinner beside us. And uh, I think this little guy is eating cow parsnip for the night. So in the morning, you can wake up and this is where you sip your coffee, uh, looking at it. Um, yeah, it's worth every step. And then the final day you drop down um, and it starts getting warmer as you drop down. So you're going through the 2003 Verdant Creek fire and there's just blankets of this purple fireweed. And in the fall, it's this really colorful brush that's not that normal for the Rockies to have all that color. So this is dropping down. Starts getting brighter. And the final step along the way is crossing the Vermilion River, which you started your trip uh, up the, on the, uh, the northern end of the river. So this is the final step. All right, so all of that brings us to the number one uh, guided hike that I like to do for Yamnuska and um, this is truly um, a complete journey through the Canadian Rockies. It's my favorite trip to guide by far. Um, it's the Banff Highline. So this is something that we do over seven days. It's over a hundred kilometers of walking, um, thousands of meters of up and down. And you start at 93 South, um, a Vista and Arnica Lake and you travel uh, for seven days and end up um, in the Spray Lakes area. So this is definitely our most challenging backpacking trip. And it's one that most hikers and backpackers aspire to do at some point in their lives. So one of the reasons why I like this trip is it helps you realize truly what you need in life. And uh, as you can tell from this photo, uh, for me, it's toilet paper and a good book. <laughs> so we're carrying basically our lives and everything we need on our back. So the first major stop along the way is in the Egypt Lake area. And uh, a lot of people just come to this area alone. It's such a iconic spot to backpack, but it's just one stop along our way. And um, yeah, it's just a series of Alpine lakes. So we actually have a half day to explore and leave our bigger packs down uh, at the campground part of the night. So you can see the little wildlife, uh, the sheep um, grazing in the meadows. This isn't an uncommon sight and it just sort of helps you realize that you're immersed in the, in the nature and um, it really gives you a sense of remoteness and connectedness with nature. So another reason why this is my top trip um, is it's not just about the connectedness with nature, but also with the people that you're um, on the trip with. So 
in this photo, you can see um, at the front, there's a young guy, he's in his 20s. Um, he's in the cowboy hat there. And then the gentleman behind him is actually in his 80s. Um, and he came here from Japan to do this trip. And the people behind them are basically spanning all the shades in between these two. And these two um, were right behind me the whole way. So you really, um, although you need to be in decent physical shape, a lot of backpacking um, and hiking in the mountains, you really just need a good mental attitude. And these guys definitely had that. So yeah, after seven days, uh, in the back country, you really get to know and connect with the people that you're with. So we travel um, after the Egypt Lake area over the Sunshine Meadows, which are these expansive um, high alpine meadows with wildflowers. And then uh, we, we can actually see our final destination here. So in the photo, that big pyramid peak in the back on the right is Mount Assiniboine, and that's where we're going to be in a couple of days. So it's pretty, pretty grand in scale. Um, but this night, we're just about to drop down to that lake after a refuel at Sunshine Meadows and uh, spend the night there. So your tent is home sweet home, and uh, it does get more and more comfortable every night. And sometimes leaving the backcountry feels a bit strange. So this is Og Lake and we're not too far from Assiniboine at this point uh, after four days of walking. And the walking is not too bad, although the distances are far. Um, you are walking along these alpine meadows with flowers all around you. There's arnica and um, the Indian paintbrush you can see on the trail there. So finally, um, you made it and you're at the Matterhorn of the Rockies. That's the big pyramid in the back, Mount Assiniboine. And the camp uh, where we're gonna spend the, the final two nights is on the shores of Lake Magog. And it's just a pretty special place to spend a few days and we get to do some side hikes and uh, just chill, which is rare for um, these long backpacking trips, these moments where you can just soak your feet and enjoy or swim in waterfalls and actually get clean. So here's some photos of some of the day hikes that we can do um, when we're on this trip. There's lots of options and uh, usually every time I like to do a different one. This one here, these folks are traveling up um, the Nublet and the Nublet is probably the most iconic place for photos. Um, you see the Matterhorn of the Rockies, the um, Mount Assiniboine in the back and all of the lakes surrounding it. So that's it guys. Um, the number one spot, Banff Highline. Um, yeah, it's straddling the continental divide where the water flows into both oceans. It's high alpine. And um, yeah, it's just really iconic in every way. So thanks everybody for tuning in to my top five. And it looks like I've got some questions. And don't forget to comment uh, what your favorite hikes are uh, in the comment box there. Or maybe uh, some suggestions of what hikes you'd like to do this summer or next. Okay, so here we go. Here's some questions. Um, all right, so what made me want to become a guide? <laughs> I, uh, I think I knew since I was really little that I couldn't work inside. And I had this fear of um, being lazy. <laughs> So I knew I had to have a job that I would be working physically and outdoors and I actually went to school and got a master's in alpine ecology and I thought I would be an ecologist. Um, but really, I just liked uh, hiking up to the alpine lakes to do my research. <laughs> so
so I started doing that full time. So it was kind of a natural transition for me. Um, yeah, and just something I, I always knew and dreamed I had to do. I used to beg my parents to, uh, to take me to the mountains when they suggested going to Florida. <laughs> okay, uh, here's another question. Um, what level of fitness would you suggest to do some of these? and some training suggestions. So that's a really good question. Um, all of these hikes, uh, I tried to say what fitness difficulty they might be. Um, and, you know, that's something that we can sort of help you figure out if you are coming on a, a trip with me, uh, we can talk and try and figure out which trip would be the best one for you. Um, so yeah, each one has a different fitness level, but I think, um, yeah, just sort of getting outside and, and running or walking with a pack. And any any time if you're training for these types of trips, you wanna um, you wanna try and do as many hill practices as you can. So put on a backpack and walk up stairs or um, just try and get as much elevation as you can in any way. And that's actually a really good way to train for these trips. And um, for things like the backpacking trips, try and walk for um, four or five hours or more um, to work up your fitness level. So you're basically building up your endurance. Um, yeah, so here's another question. How long is a typical day? Um, that again, depends on the trip, but I guess, um, for the Banff High Line, which is our most challenging trip, uh, we're usually walking eight hours a day. Um, obviously, there's some really nice long breaks in there um, where you're taking a lot of water and, and the key is drinking a lot and eating a lot as you go along. Um, but on the rock wall, we might only be walking for four or five hours. So that's why it's rated as easy to moderate. Um, Okay, so here's a question. Um, what is the best time of year to do a lot of these hikes? So uh, in a normal year, we have uh, quite a lot of people visiting the Canadian Rockies. And this year, I guess, will be a bit of an exception um, due to the travel restrictions. Um, but normally, Midsummer, so July through August is when most people are here. So my favorite time to guide is actually just on the, the windows outside of these really busy times. Um, and it just sort of gives you that sense of, of being alone in the mountains and sort of having it all to yourself. So I really like um, June and September and even early October can be really nice times to do these. Okay, um, another question here. What are your equipment recommendations for day hiking? So for day hiking, um, I usually have a 30 liter pack. And in my pack, I, I always tell people um, to bring just one more layer than they think they need. And even in the summer, uh, bring your toque and your gloves. So I've been caught out in so many uh, rainstorms and sometimes they turn into snowstorms even in July. So yeah, always pack that down jacket. It's small, it's light and a light rain jacket. And uh, as you can see in this photo below, um, that's probably July and I'm wearing my toque and my gloves. Um, yeah, and then I always have a, at least a liter of water and a uh, first aid kit. Um, and in my first aid kit, I always try and think of what the worst thing could happen is and do I have enough stuff in my first aid kit for that. And one of the things that never leaves my pack is uh, a small tarp. So if it is raining really heavy, um, I can just pull the tarp up over me and my group and we can stay dry and wait out the rain usually. Um, and hiking poles, you can see in this photo, I have a hiking pole in my hand. Um, these are really helpful, even if you're not used to having them or you don't think you're gonna need them. Um, if you sort of roll an ankle or twist an ankle, having hiking poles is something that's gonna get you off the mountain. 
Okay, so I think that's it for questions. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, and if um, if you guys are around next week, we're gonna have another talk, uh, same time, same place. So hopefully you can join us and hopefully we'll see you out in the mountains soon. <laughs>